Hey everybody, I'm back again. We're going to get this steady moving and rolling today. We are picking up with Genesis, the sixth chapter. So we're going to go a little bit further into this study. We have gone all the way from chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, and we're coming to chapter six. Now, chapter six is a interesting chapter, uh, not because of things we haven't already experienced or just like, wow, but Chapter six is really going to have some stuff going on. That's kind of, uh, I don't want to say sci-fi ish when we're talking about tech, you know, dealing with the text of scripture, but I mean, it's, it's some, uh, <laughs> it's some, uh, genetic engineering kind of stuff going on. So, uh, I want to give a disclaimer. I do recognize everybody is not going to see it the same way that I'm going to see it as we're studying this, but I want to make sure that I am giving a fair, uh, and detailed explanation of what I believe about chapter six of Genesis. So uh, grab your Bibles, grab your friends, grab your pasta, whoever it is. Let's let's go into this study and look a little bit further. So we are in Genesis, the sixth chapter at the first verse and the Bible would read. And it came to pass when men began, began, uh, began to, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. That the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And so uh, when it picks up this, it's, again, it's always important to remember that the Bible in its original composition did not have chapters and verses. This was a later edition for organizational purposes. So to really uh, get the full idea of the narrative and how it's uh, really continuing, we need to go to all the way to verse 32 uh, of Genesis 5. And just pick it up there. It says, and Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem. Ham and Japheth. And so when it picks up in verse one and says, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. So it's letting us know that, okay, things are working out. Uh, the boys have gotten married and there's been a multiplication that siblings are married siblings. And those people are like, what happened is, well, it was a different time. The genetic poop wasn't as, um, wasn't as filtered out. So, I mean, you, my suspicion is, is that, because the genetic pool was at the place that it was at at that time that people could still have relations and be siblings. But we do know later on, no, the Lord did put a prohibition. He said, cut that out. Uh, so uh, it was for a practical purpose. But here we see that people are multiplying on the face of the earth. They're growing, uh, that they're having uh, uh, children. So when you get to verse two. Now, for people, now, what's interesting, because when we go to chapter six, this is where people usually take the instance of like, well, uh, these were, uh, you know, when it says giants, it really doesn't mean giants. It just mean uh, it, it's really just talking about these uh, guys who were just bigger than life. No, 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 no. That's not what he was saying. Verse two, and the sons of God, hey, saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took the wives of all which they chose. Now, if we're still dealing with a strictly human idea of people getting with other people and people mating with other people, why in the world would it say the sons of God if sons of God just means sons? I mean, like, that doesn't even make any sense in the flow. You already said that people are having that they're multiplying in verse two. It says, so if sons of God meant that these guys were talking about being human, the daughters of men, that they were fair. I mean, what else would men think a woman look like? I mean, so what you will notice this phrase, sons of God, is Ben Elohim. Ben Elohim uh, is a common uh, phraseology uh, in the Hebrew that deals with uh, angels, the angels. So when I say Ben Elohim, uh, it's like Ben is son of Elohim, sons of God, direct sons of God. OK, uh, they saw that the daughters were fair. They noticed that they were good looking. Uh, now, some would even take this passage to even uh, tie into Corinthians, the uh, first Corinthians 11 chapter when it gives the prohibition against women cutting their hair, uh, which I, which I do believe uh, that this is what it, it was in reference to this. I'm not going to go as far as that. I think Michael Heisler, and again, I don't read everything that Michael Heisler says, but he brings up a pretty good idea about that, that maybe, you know, we can look at a little bit later, uh, that they took into them wives of all which they chose. Now notice the reaction of verse three. 
up to this point, it has not said anything about anybody doing anything that is wrong for humans to do. Right? I just want you to. A lot of times, you know, and, and, and again, I understand people have their motives and their agendas, but I will say I agree with Michael Heisler on this, is that people have so, tried so, so, you know, just to strip the supernatural out of the Bible. And I think, you know, if we're going to believe in that a man can get out the grave and that God can come in flesh, I mean, look, we just have to just open up our floodgates and just take take it by by by, by faith. Verse three says, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that. He also is flesh yet his day shall be in 120 years. I do believe that 120 years is a general estimate of some things. Look, verse four, there were giants in the earth in those days. Very clear statement. I know some people can go into the original words and say, well, it really wasn't giants. It was, it was, uh, it was just uh, allegorical. No, no, I believe they were really giants. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bear children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. I do believe because what, what's interesting here, and I actually read a book on giants, not that I agree, not that I agree with everything that some of these guys postulate. But I do believe that there was a time in the earth where giants did exist. Now, before somebody takes us and cuts it and put on World Star and says this guy's a religious extremist and he's he's crazy, you even have a quote from Abraham Lincoln in his diary, uh, where he quotes even talks about some of the bones that can be viewed at that time. And that's during the time of the United States that you could go and look at the bones of giants. Uh, when he talked about when he went to the Niagara Falls, he was in reference to how old it was. So this was documented in every culture in the world, despite how remote they may have been, has some kind of culture or some kind of, um, I don't want to say myth narrative, but some kind of narrative dealing with the uh, activity of giants in every part of the world. I personally kind of think when the Bible talks about, like when Paul said in the New Testament, you know, that the Gentiles had sacrificed unto idols, right? that these idols are actually demons. My suspicion is that the spirits of these giants, because you got to think about it, when something dies, doesn't it have a spirit if it's human? What if it's half human and half angel? Well, you say, well, no, Brandon, I still... I was, and I don't know why every time somebody's arguing with me, they always sound like that in my head. You know, maybe I'm just nuts. I, I still think that these, this, no, sons of God, no, they were the sons of uh, Cain. That's what they were. They were not the sons of Seth. One, it did not say that. Why couldn't he just say sons of Cain and then just say sons of God? I mean, like, that's a big mistake to make. They don't even sound alike. Uh, when you look at the translation of the Septuagint, praise the Lord, I feel good here. In the New Testament, I want you to pay special attention to this, uh, uh, but at the Septuagint, when it translates this, it uses angels. Now, you know the story of the Septuagint. There's certainly uh, supposedly 70 elders. They translated it, and they got, because the problem was because of the hyper-Hellenization of the ancient Mediterranean world, that you had a lot of Jews who didn't even speak Hebrew. And so they had to get a copy of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. Uh, before Hellenization would probably make them cease to be a people. And so certainly these Hebrew scholars of their time, these guys, certainly they know what the Greek word means. They understand what it's trying to communicate. And so they seem to think it was angels. That's all I'm saying. And you say, well, that was a Septuagint. That wasn't the Hebrew scriptures. And again, I don't know why it sounds like that. Well, it's important. It's, 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 it's important to remember, right, that Jesus, he quoted from the Septuagint. Oh, my goodness, from Zion. Uh, this was some people, they have problems with, with translations and the Hebrew roots folks and the Hebrew Israelites and whatever they whatever they think they are. Uh, the black Hebrew Israelites. You got to use the Hebrew. No, no. Jesus quoted from a translation. So why can't I quote from a translation? As long as it solidifies and communicates the thoughts of the original authors. But I ain't going to hit on that. Uh, so this is interesting. There were giants in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bear children to them. See, and I want you to think about this. If it was wrong, if it was something going on, if it was normal, why would this be so out of the ordinary? 
Well, you know, the sons of Cain, because I'm still going to believe it. Didn't God didn't have an issue with Cain getting married. That wasn't the problem. You know, we just sometimes we're so quick to insert our own narrative into what's going on. And the mighty man, and this is part of my thing, like, you know, Paul talked about these guys, they were sacrificing unto demons, right? What you understand with a lot of the Greek mythology and the Greek gods, they're this thing that's called demigods. And a demigod is a half human, half God. Now, I would imagine to angels that are manifesting or, or making themselves seen, people say, well, an angel wouldn't do that. Well, no. Well, I don't want to get into angelology, but we got to remember angels have free will. They have utility of thought. They are just as much unique in their person as we are, but they do not have the same privileges of redemption because of their uh, creative advantages. So every time I read in the Bible and I see about an angel appearing to somebody, what do they always have to say? Be not afraid. Be, whoa, whoa, peace unto you. Be not afraid. Why do they have to keep doing that? Because they are awesome. So much to the extent that when a, when an angel is talking to a human, it's something about our uh, inability sometimes to maybe discern supernatural uh, expressions of beings. Uh, they had to tell the prophets one time, you know, in, in John the Revelator, like, hey, don't don't worship me. I'm one of the, your brother. Like, oh, OK, I just I just uh, why would he do that? He must have assumed that it was a God. Yay, you like this kind of teaching. I know you do. They understood that it was something about their presence that put them in mind. And that's why the Bible calls them sons of God. And every son has the likeness or something that makes them resemble their father. This is good teaching. I know it is. Praise the Lord. Well, <laughs> I'm just cutting up. But I'm serious, though. Think about this. So when you're looking in the Greek mindset, right? And these guys, are, I think the worship of these, when Paul said these are demons, I think the spirits of de demons, as we would call them, are actually the disembodied spirits of the giants. Now, if I'm wrong, you pray for me because I don't want to be an error. But I believe this is what happened. These men of renown, I believe in a lot of these ancient cultures, these guys were seeing things. I believe stuff was really, ha I believe the ancient world was a lot more supernaturally active than what we're giving these people credit for. We love to act like these people didn't have good sense. We love, you know, and it's just the arrogance of our age intellectually. We think because we got electricity, what well, nobody's smart before us. No, you just got lights. I don't have lights. That don't mean you. I, that don't mean I'm dumb because you got electricity uh, that we know of. Even though I've read some archaeological stuff, but I ain't gonna hit on <laughs> any that. Only thing I'm saying: don't let your your lights make you arrogant. What make you think these people, you think these people didn't have no sense to notice something that was 10 feet tall, 11 feet tall? What you got, Agabeshon, how big his bed was. You got the stuff that was going on in the Greek world. What if these folks really were experiencing supernatural manifestations, but in actuality, they were just demonic, right? But they really were not uh, divine in the what the demons, of course, uh, evil or uh, uh, demon angel will tell you they're God, you know, can't trust their word. And it got so bad because of these angels uh, that the Bible says in verse six, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Now, I don't want to get into conversation about open theism uh, because that's a that's a whole thing that traditionally or, or more mainline apostolic Pentecostals, we do not maintain a position of open theism. Uh, we, we do believe that God uh and his sovereignty sees all things, but yes, yet gives us the ability to make decisions. Uh, when the Bible says God repented, it's not like how we repent of sins. It means to change, change uh, one mind, change ugh, tongue tied, to change one mind, and, to, and thereby changing the direction. And so, when the Bible says He repented that He made man, He said, "Okay, since you want to do what you want to do, I'm gonna change direction, do something different." That's what the Bible means when it says repent. I'm like, oh no, I couldn't have saw this coming because I don't know all things. That's it. That's the open theist God, not the God of the Bible. Uh, let's look at verse seven. And I'm, I'm just getting, getting, you know, just I'm having a good time today. Uh, verse seven And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and all the fowls of the air. For repenteth me that I have made him. So he's going to put a plan together to change some things and to get rid of some things. Now, this is the part where I may lose a few subscribers. There is a, 
an ancient form of writing called the Book of Enoch. Now, the Book of Enoch is probably uh, probably the oldest copy. Now, it's probably in the Ethiopic tradition, probably which we probably call the Coptic Christian tradition, which I do not espouse their doctrine. Uh, the Book of Enoch suggests, and I'm going to give this another disclaimer. I am not suggesting that the Book of Enoch is canon. I am not suggesting that it should be used for a basis of sound doctrine. What I am saying is that it is hard to deny that we have a new, new Testament writers quoting from the book of Enoch. We got Peter, when he talked about, you know, he talked about a little bit, we got Jude taking like a whole line quoting from it. And you like for person, no, that's not it. Then where did Peter get that from? Where in the Bible else do we find that? Obviously he was quoting from something that was a received source of truth. Uh, some people say, well, no, but just like uh, Paul will quote from things, uh, and say, I think that's the one where they talk about the uh, uh, when he, in Titus, when he told him this reason I let the in Crete to set those things and they talk about the uh, uh, the quote, quote from Epimenides I believe that was his name, about you know, the Grecians are lazy and they're slothful this and that. Paul said, this witness is true. You see what I'm saying? Uh, the way they're quoting from this, it's not given the same hedge of warning. Uh, it'll make me seem that this was a document that was highly respected. Now, what are you trying to say? Just because a document is respected as a source of truth does not mean that it is a source of inspiration. I'm going to say that again. Just because a document can be used to verify something to be true uh, does not mean that it is a source of doctrinal uh, 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 teaching. Now, just like I can quote Josephus, just like I can quote uh, Heraclitus, it doesn't mean that I'm taking what they're saying. And I'm like, oh, first chapter of uh, 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 Heraclitus, read, no, no. Uh, first, first works of Eusebius, no, that's not what I'm doing. I'm just building the case that maybe Enoch can see something. And I'm not willing to accept the whole book, of even the whole book of Enoch as uh, maybe a good reference because there's issues of textual transmission when you get to like second Enoch. But uh, the portion that Jude quoted from, it talked about the angels that kept not their estate, that pretty much these guys got together. They made this plan. They decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to figure out how to, uh, and the book of Enoch really doesn't tell us our, their, their whole motive, but what they did, they said, we're going to take us some wives and what we're going to do, we're going to teach them some forbidden arts. Now, my suspicion, maybe there were some things that they were going to, uh, supposed to play in the, the, the bigger part of man's, uh, creative responsibility. But these guys, according to the book of Enoch, one was like, what we're going to do Hey, Azazel, you gonna teach him this? This other guy, a uh, hockey did. I forget. They got they got all kinds of names. And uh, these guys, they are going to now teach people how to do things they shouldn't. One angel taught them how to take metals and to manipulate them uh, for the use of uh, uh, warfare, metallurgy, uh, or, or militaristic metallurgy. Uh, another angel decided that you know what we're gonna do. And I know a lot of folks ain't gonna like this, but look, I'm I look. I'm Episodic Pentecostal, so I, I preach against jewelry. Don't like it. I mean, look, I'm sorry. I'm just giving my sanctified opinion. One angel went and said, oh, I teach them how to make makeup. I teach them how to make jewelry. Why? What were they going to do with that? So they can learn how to seduce men and make them fall to sexual temptation. Well, I just don't buy that. See, what you got to understand, because men are visually stimulated. And by what they see, they're going to be attracted to it. And that's going to take them into more morality. Like these angels have problems and any good anthropologist will tell you even, uh, uh, it's like not Kevin Peterson. Uh, I forgot the guy's name. Who's taking everybody off in Canada with, with just good common sense. Uh, he will tell you that the reason that women wear makeup in the certain way, even though they may not be consciously aware that they're doing that, the psychological part of it, that makeup develop, uh, in a way like one, why a woman's lips are painted red and all these things is to, highlight uh circulation the type of circulation that a woman because anybody that's been you know around a woman you know she looks different when she's in the mood so this is what the makeup does it highlights a woman's sexual appeal visually so that men can look and when i see it biologically i you know I'm like oh oh you ready see that's what <laughs> but i ain't gonna hit on that 
But that's that's what one angel did. Another one said, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to teach him witchcraft. I'm going to teach him how to play with charms and, and all this kind of carrying on. I'm going to teach him how to do all of this mess. So you got all of this. And even in every culture of the world, there is always some form of witchcraft. Now, a lot of it is flim flam nonsense, just useless superstition. But within each culture, what you will notice, there is a distinct art or science of working in the dark arts. I remember growing up in uh, Happy Hill Church of God, Pentecostal, in my grandfather's church. Uh, that one, He pastored two churches when I was a child. One of the churches uh, had a church in a place that was called uh, Africatown. That was where the last slave was uh, brought. Uh, the last slave ship they bought in, uh, uh, in a bet. You know, they lost it. He had to burn the ship. And they, interestingly enough, they actually just recently got a grant to kind of revitalize because it looks rough. <laughs> uh, but I remember uh, as a child growing up in Little Holiness Church, oh, man, you talking about the services were powerful. They were hot, hot. The other day, my son uh, touched the light bulb and he was like, I mean, that's how them services were. You could feel the spiritual energy. Those folks were, it was almost like they were in a fight all the time. And it turns out, you know, uh, there was a lot of ritual African magic that was always practiced. So even a lot of people, they win, they had to wrestle and preach against witchcraft really strong. Like, saints, y'all stop putting that dust in that, don't you? Saints don't got no business putting dust in the corner. That's a form of hex and leaving your hat on the bed and uh, leaving the chicken on the porch. And, you know, it was like, because whenever you go into a territory, and I'm getting off topic, uh, but I'm still on assignment. Thank you, Jesus. Whenever you go into a territory and you're dealing with warfare, you are going to shake up some of the regional uh, spirits that don't want people to see deliverance. Uh, and so, you know, we, and I say all that to say is that it's quite possible that uh, these angels may have had some to do with that. Because a lot of these forms of witchcrafts, what you notice is certain uh there are certain witchcraft theories that seem to be universal in all of these uh, forms of uh, wickedness. But let's let's look a little bit further and we're going to go into our study today into a little bit more. Uh, verse eight. But thank God the Bible talks about this man named Noah. Noah. Uh, Noah at verse eight found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, what I like about this is that even before. Noah was given the instruction what to do. Noah found grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Uh, that it was something that Noah did not earn. It was something that Noah didn't say, Woo, I'm glad I worked for it. But just because Noah had received that favor, it doesn't mean that Noah was exempt from obeying what the scriptures told him to do. Verse 8, but Noah found for grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just Man, just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Now, it's important to understand that perfection doesn't mean flawlessness. And I, and I do believe in our English context, when we think of perfect, we think flawless. But perfect means complete. In the Greek, it's teleos. Even though I know this is in the, you know, but if you're reading the Septuagint, the Old Testament, it'd be teleos. Uh, Noah was perfect. Some would even say that this perfect, uh, has a connotation of genetic perfectness, uh, that his DNA was not uh, tampered with, that he was uh, all the way, uh, which would make sense if you have genetic mixing going on, because the promise of Genesis 3.15 is that the woman had to come through the seed of the woman or, or the descendant of the woman. And that would not be a promise if the blood was, was, was mixed with something that was not human. So Satan was probably trying to uh, plant genetic uh defects all throughout the bloodline so that the promise can be realized. It can be considered maybe the first form of genetic warfare. And the Bible says, uh, in Noah, we got three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And these are going to be three sons in which the three people groups of the world are going to descend from. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and beheld it was uh, corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth, uh, destroy them with uh, with the earth. Now, this is what I like. Now, we know Noah had already found grace, but it doesn't mean that Noah was already saved. Hey, what are you trying to say? The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto 
all men. See, the grace can appear unto you. Hallelujah. But there is a part that you have to do. The Bible says that when that grace comes, that it's going to begin to teach us something. Teach us to deny ungodliness. Huh? Teach us to deny unrighteousness. Teach us to deny things that are not. Why we got to do all that? So that we can live righteously, godly, soberly in this present world. Come on here, Bible. Uh, you know, I wish I had one of them Bible readers. You know, like from the Sanctified Church, you, you used to have the uh <laughs> used to have the readers read for the preacher. And he said, Read Bible. And the Bible says that God created. Yeah, I wish, man, I wish I had one of those. That'd be right on time right now. Make me feel like preaching. But he says, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do, Noah. He says in verse 8, make thee an ark of gold for wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark and shall pitch it within and without and with pitch. Uh, and notice God has given him very instructions. Uh, I want to ask the folks who kind of believe that you can just live and do what you want to. And you don't have to obey the word of God in order to be saved. Uh, I want you to pay attention to this. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make in it, of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits and the breadth of it 50 cubits and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shall thou make to ark and in a cubit shall thou finish it above and the door of the ark shall thou sit in the side thereof with lower, second and third stories shall thou make it. And behold, I even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. Let, and this is the this is the interesting part here, uh, verse eighteen through uh, twenty two. But with thee I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, to of every sort, shall thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female of fowls after their kind, and of every cow after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee all the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee. It shall be for the food uh, for thee and for them. Thus did know according to all. All that God commanded him, so did he. If Noah had been in a main line denominational church today, they say, "Well, Noah, that's legalism. You don't have to build an ark in order to be saved because you're already saved. You build the ark to show that you are already saved from the flood. That doesn't make any sense. Baptism is just an outward sign to show an inward change. No, no, no." Um, well, you don't have scripture. Well, I'm so glad you asked. Let's let's turn to First Peter. Praise the Lord. Uh, the fourth chapter. Uh, uh, First Peter, the fourth chapter, at the 17th verse. Because you know the apostles gonna have a little bit uh, to say about this. And if you if you want to uh, if you want to argue with an apostle, uh, that's you. Now it's it's important to remember that Peter is the one who opened the doors uh, on the day of Pentecost. This doesn't mean. Uh, that he was like, you know, the superintendent of the apostles, but God gave him the keys. Now, he didn't give him the throne. I don't know what Peter got a throne from. Maybe y'all can ask the Pope about that. Maybe he can help you. But God did give him the keys, and that keys was the right to open the gospel message. Uh, First Peter 4 and 17, praise the Lord. Uh, do, 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 let me see. Uh, First Peter, excuse me. Second Peter. Excuse me, 2 Peter, the second chapter. I'm getting getting mixed up. Yeah, did, did, did. I'm really off today. Uh, <laughs> second Peter, uh, uh, the third chapter, the sixth verse. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, and here is the blessings, partakers. Uh, even so, Sarah obeyed. Uh, da, 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 da. okay, here we go. First Peter, the third chapter, 20th verse. Uh, the Bible says, Oh, but yeah, let's go to verse 18. For Christ also hath suffered for sins that, uh, 
the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit, by which also he went and preached into the spirits in prison, uh, which I believe, which sometimes were disobedience when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Look at what verse 21 tells us. It says, the life figure where unto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, whee, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Now, the Bible says that just like Noah's ark was essential for those folks to be saved, us being baptized in water is essential for us to have the same. Well, what is it going to save you from? From the future judgment that is going to come. The Bible says that when the Lord appears from heaven, he's going to come back and punish all that know not God nor obey his gospel. This is the interesting part. God told Noah some things to do to protect the ark. He said, Noah, I want you to pitch it on the inside. Noah, I want you to get some of that pitch on the outside. Noah said, well, why do I have to do that? See, you don't have to understand the typology to be saved by the typology. What you have to do is have enough sense to submit to the word of God and take what he has told us to do by faith, which is Acts 2.38, repent of our sins, be baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, so that you may receive the Holy Ghost with the initial sign or witness of speaking in other tongues. Uh, this is interesting because we live in an age where everybody wants to make things the way they want to make them. They want to move it the way they want to make them. But it's hard to get it wrong when you follow what God said. Noah, he received instructions, what I want you to do. My last point before I go, because I know it's time to wrap up. Notice who God was talking to. Noah uh, was the leader of his home. Now, I'm not saying that uh, God doesn't deal with the ladies. I'm not saying that God doesn't, because I, there, there I am a strong advocate for ladies in ministry. Uh, I, I support women. Uh, I am not a, I'm not intimidated because you have a call of God on your life. Uh, but when it comes to the order of the home, we have to recognize, and I do believe the home uh, is a manifestation of the church. Uh, the man is the spiritual leader of the home. I'm sorry. That's what the book say. Uh, God spoke to Noah. There are some things as a man that I'm going to take responsibility for to help ensure that my family is saved. Now, thank God for the, the women who in a lot of situations where the man was not in place spiritually, where she had to step up to the plate and get things done. Thank God for her. And I believe the grace of God was there to help that woman through that situation. But what did Jesus, what did they tell Jesus? Jesus quoted, said, well, about marriage and divorce. Jesus said, well, from the beginning, it was not so See, From the beginning, when we go back to the original plan of God, everybody want to sing about, let's get back to Eden. No, let's get back to the book. Huh? God has a plan for the family and God has a plan for, for us to be saved. But Noah is going to save his family by building the ark. What if Noah wouldn't have built the ark? Would his family would have been saved? Mm-mm. I think this is something that, that we need to really take, especially in this end time hour. There is some spiritual pitch that we need to build in our house. We need to build a line of separation on the inside and out. This isn't a time to let ungodly media sit, sit in into it. This is not a time to let the world sip into our homes because once again, get in our houses, it's going to be in our churches. And there are a whole slew of apostolic churches just going, doo -doo 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 -doo, going down. I don't care what fellowship you in. Everybody's fighting the same battle. Well, some of us ain't fighting at all. Some of us are endorsing it. But I ain't going to hit on there right now. But we thank the Lord uh, for that. And so I want to encourage everybody that can to let's make sure that we walk in holiness, righteousness, uh, so that we can be the example of godliness in this end time hour. Lord bless you in Jesus name. Remember, it's the whole gospel for the whole world by the whole church. Bless you in Jesus name.